So without further ado, I move on to tonight's event. And I'm very pleased to welcome Carl Ullman from the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, although tonight he's actually coming from Sweden. So we've got a, a truly international event uh, at the moment. Uh, Carl's research looks into the ethical challenges regarding the management of digital human remains, which is effectively data left behind by deceased users. Uh, tonight, I think he's going to talk on the ethics and politics of digital human remains, a subject which I guess should interest us all. Um, so without any more ado, I'll, I'll hand over from Carl and uh, disappear from the scene, I think. So, uh... Lovely. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and it's, it's truly an honor to, to be invited to, to speak uh, and something that I've uh, anticipated for, for a long time. Um, the presentation that I'll do today um, will cover my work um, over the past four years roughly uh, and pretty well summarizes my, my doctoral work. Um, I will talk about a number of publications that I've done throughout this talk um, and um, I, I can share those afterwards um, but you could also just google my name uh, and, uh, and, and watch my, my Google Scholar profile and uh, all of the publications that I, that I cite in here um, will be available from there. So I thought I'd start by um, just giving you Bit of background to the research I've been conducting. And the basic story, let's see, the basic story is that within the next three decades alone, roughly 2.2 billion people will die. And that's a mind-blowing number in and of itself. But if you add to this that Currently, we have roughly 4.5 billion internet users in the world, and this number is growing steadily. We know that only within the next couple of decades, we're going to see an unprecedented amount of dead people leaving their data behind on their devices, but also, and perhaps more importantly, uh, on the web. Because everything we do, everything we click on, more or less, is registered somewhere and recorded on a server. And that data will still be there uh, after the day that we've passed away. So naturally, the matter is, what do we do with this data? And this is the question that most of us perhaps face um, as individuals. Someone passes away and um, we have their Facebook profile and maybe their Spotify account and their, their Gmail. And we ask ourselves, what do I do with this person's data? Do I have a right to access it? Uh, should I destroy it? And so on. But since there are so many of us uh, that will in, in the next couple of decades and, and certainly in the, the next century, if I go back and show you this graph, we see that towards the end of the century, we're going to approach 8 billion dead people, many of whom, of course, will be internet users. So my point here is that we're not just facing this question of what do we do with digital remains? We're not just facing that question as individuals, but also as a society and as a civilization. And uh, in this presentation, I will, I will focus a lot on this societal uh, collective level. Um, but, but if you have questions also on, on the individual level of, um, you know, how to think about your, your own data and so on, um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions about that towards the end as well. So when I started my research, I stumbled across something that I call the digital afterlife industry. So wherever there is um, new technology, there there will be a business, naturally. Um, and usually, as I mentioned, what what we leave behind when we die is, um, you know, maybe some of us leave behind diaries. We leave behind all kinds of 
of possessions, uh, maybe letters. But today, a majority of our communication is digital. So we do not leave behind uh, physical letters and diaries, but rather we leave behind a data profile, which is not just a descriptive uh, overview of our life and, and conversations with other people, but also a profile, a behavioral profile, in terms of uh, who we are, what we like, our preferences, and so on. I'm sure many of you may have seen this Rembrandt painting, which, in fact, is not at all a painting by Rembrandt, depending on how you see it. What it is, is in fact um, an AI that has analyzed all of Rembrandt's paintings. Uh, the way he uses the brush, the colors, the motifs he's using, um, how the lighting touches the, the, the object in his paintings, and then produced a new painting based on those patterns. And um, I am personally no expert in art, but I would say that this is pretty close to something that Rembrandt would have done himself. Certainly someone could have fooled me into thinking this is the real thing. And the point is that if a couple of oil paintings alone is enough to reproduce a person's style or their artistic uh, expression, imagine what you could do with a corpus of an entire life captured in data. And this is a theme that has reoccurred in, in science fiction literature and, and uh, movies for quite some time. When I talk about my research, a lot of people mention this episode from um, the sci-fi series uh, Black Mirror. And in this episode, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, there it starts with, with a couple. Uh, and the husband in this couple is uh, constantly using his phone, constantly updating on Twitter and so on, and posting pictures of everything. But one day he is in a car accident and he dies. Now, after the funeral, the wife is approached by a company saying, look, he left behind so much data that we can actually use that data to create a chatbot where you can chat with a bot that will be just like the real thing. It's the best way to go through the mourning process. And at first she objects to this, but eventually she buys into the concept and she buys the app and she starts chatting with her dead husband based on the behavioral data that he left behind. And she soon finds that it's surprisingly accurate it's surprisingly like him. It has his humor. It talks about the topics that he used to talk about uh, and in the manner that, that she recognizes. Now, the bot version one day suggests that, you know that there's actually also an audio service because the husband left behind so much uh, audio data uh, and videos that she can actually take this one step further and she buys a voice service whereby she can call her dead husband and have actual conversations with him. And then of course the voice service suggests, oh, don't you wanna buy like an actual humanoid robot that will look just like your husband? And she does. And the point of the episode is it's not just her husband, it's, a specific version of him is an interpretation of him, um, a little bit charmier, a little bit sexier, a, a bit more um, humorous, and so on. It is, in a lot of ways, the perfect product. And to little surprise, perhaps, um, this is also real. There are several companies offering a similar service. Most of them are right now in beta mode, but this, for instance, MIT startup attorney.me with a flashy headline, become virtually immortal, offers to create a chatbot, a virtual avatar based on your, your Twitter data, your Facebook data, and your, your geodata and so on. 
So you actually give them access to all of your profiles and they turn that into an actual chatbot. And this is just one out of many similar companies. I'm, I'm sure many of you might have seen um, on the news lately that in South Korea, um, a group of, of engineers created um, a replica out of um, a deceased child so that um, the mother could say her last farewell to this child in an, a virtual reality environment um, where she had the, the, the VR glasses on and she could actually more or less touch the child, um, which also interacted with her touch um, uh, through certain gloves that, that uh, could sense um, how the mother was was touching the child. So this is very much a real thing. It's not just um, sci-fi anymore, but something that exists on the market uh, today. Now, these kind of services uh, tell us a lot about the relationship, or rather they, they pose difficult questions about the relationship between ourselves and the data that we leave behind. And there are a number of ways philosophically to think about this, this relationship. Most commonly, we think about the relationship between a deceased person and the data that they leave behind kind of in terms of a digital estate, that our data is like a possession, like a car that, that we own. And uh, when we die, that is passed down to our children or to whoever is next to kin um, that gets the rightful ownership of it. And this view takes us pretty far. It solves a lot of legal and, and, and philosophical problems as well, but it doesn't go quite all the way, uh, especially when it comes to ethics. So in, in my school of thought, which is the philosophy of information, we tend to think about the relationship between you and your data, not just in terms of a possession, something that you own, but rather like something that you are. So your data is kind of like your hand. It's something that is an object, but at the same time, it is you. So what is done to your data is also done to you, meaning that the data that we leave behind uh, after we're gone is kind of analogous, at least on an ethical level, to a digital corpse. So sometimes people have in interpreted my argument as saying that, you know, viewing data as a possession is wrong, uh, which is not at all what I'm arguing here. What I'm arguing is that we need a pluralism uh, or a plurality of various analogies and metaphors in order to understand this complex relationship between our data and ourselves so that we can fully grasp uh, what it means for deceased people to be present online. So in a study that, or in, in two studies that I published with uh, my supervisor, Luciano Floridi, in uh, 2017 and 18, um, we suggested that this idea of um, uh, the, the digital or informational corpse, it actually hints towards how we can regulate this industry. Because as of now, deceased people don't have any data protection rights whatsoever. You can, they don't have any privacy. You can more or less do whatever you want to a dead person's data. And this is stated explicitly in the GDPR that the GDPR covers only living data subjects. So in these two studies, we suggest that if digital remains are to be looked upon as analogous to our biological human remains, it makes sense to regulate the industry with inspiration from how we regulate trade with biological human remains. And a very good place to, to start in or to seek in inspiration from is um, the ICOM Code of Ethics. And that is the International Council of Museums Code of Ethics. Because of course, archeological museums have done similar things to the digital afterlife industry for years. 
They have paying customers who come into museums uh, to watch the exhibitions, which in a lot of cases contain biological human remains. So in this convention, uh, it's stated very clearly that um, any exhibition at a museum that contains human remains must always put the exhibition uh, or um, must, must always uh, organize the exhibition in a way that respects the human dignity of the individuals um, that to which the human remains belong. And it's quite clearly stated that these are still people. They may be dead people, but they deserve dignity nevertheless. We don't put a uh, Santa Claus hat on Utsi the Iceman uh, during Christmas to attract more visitors. And we don't have ghost tours in the tomb, tomb of, of Tutankhamun. Because we would find those things objectionable. They would be violating the human dignity of those individuals. It also states that um, any exhibition must take into account the intrinsic value of the, the remains. And I think that is something that is applicable to um, the digital afterlife industry as well, uh, in the sense that when we think of the ethics of dead people online, we shouldn't just take into account, even though it's important, the well-being of the descendants and of the consumers of these services, but we must also take into account the actual dead people uh, as ethical patients in and of themselves with an intrinsic right to dignity. Um, and a classic example is where um, parents of, um, of uh, queer children or, or queer people in general um, get access to their Facebook account or they, their Facebook profile after their death and they start erasing any trace of them being queer or, or gay or having any sort of, um, of deviant uh, identity in any way, which is of course a violation to, to their identity. Um, so being a parent or being next to kin doesn't automatically give you a right to, to violate this intrinsic right of uh, the dead person. All right, moving along, I thought I'd just show you this other really curious example. It's, it's a bit of a parenthesis, but uh, something that I found researching uh, this, this industry was something that I call Islamic prayer apps. So, in the Arabic-speaking world, especially in Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia, it's very popular to subscribe to apps which will start tweeting out Islamic supplications, so like Islamic prayers, uh, from your Twitter profile. So they do this automatically. You actually don't have to press any buttons, but you just go onto the website and you click to subscribe and it gets access to your Twitter profile, and after a couple of hours, you start tweeting out various supplications from the Quran. Um, and some of the services even allow you to choose your own supplications and uh, set different timings for it uh, for an extra charge. What does this have to do with digital afterlife and digital human remains? Well quite a lot, it turns out, because I looked at roughly 10 of these services and they all have one thing in common, which is that they advertise themselves as digital afterlife services. They say explicitly that we will tweet for you and please God um, in this life and the next life. We promise to keep tweeting after you're dead. So it turns out that in Islam, it's actually the case that things that you set in motion during your life that takes place or that, that take place after your death can actually be good for you in the afterlife. So the hypothesis here is that if you set in motion a Twitter bot, or rather you're doing it from your own authentic account, so it's not really a bot, that tweets out supplications, that will be good for you after your death. 
in a way quite similar to, to Catholic indulgences. Um, I thought this was really curious um, and decided to track just one of these services called Dua. Doing so was really a surprise because what we found was that this app alone tweeted about 1.9 million tweets per day. So that is, as you can see, roughly one tenth, um, a little more than 10% than of Arabic speaking Twitter, at least 20, 2014. So it's, it's an approximation there. But this app alone is a much, much bigger than, for instance, um, uh, the week before the, the US general election where everyone talked about thoughts, that was only roughly 0.5%. At the most bot intensive week, um, same thing during the Arabic Spring, the hashtag Egypt, which was sort of the hashtag that, that gathered the, the entire protest, was only 0.2%. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that the presence of the dead online is not just some fringe phenomenon that exists in, in Silicon Valley and in, in sci-fi series, but it's a quite real phenomenon that is happening today in, in rather unexpected forms all over the world. All right, so moving on to this bit more macro societal perspective. Uh, one of the studies that has gotten the most attention uh, that I've done uh, media-wise um, is a 2019 study uh, called Are the Dead Taking Over Facebook? This I'd seen in media, uh, often people report that oh, one day the dead are going to take over Facebook and there are going to be more dead people than alive on Facebook. But I couldn't really find any reliable data on this, but, but only speculation. Luckily, there are quite good data on this matter that allows you to, to predict uh, when or how many dead profiles there are going to be on Facebook during a given year in the 21st century. So me and my colleague, uh, David Watson, we took uh, United Nations um, mortality data projected into the 21st century and we matched that with Facebook penetration data and what we got was graphs looking like this. So suppose that Facebook would stop growing today. They would, they would attract zero users as of 20, 2019 then you would have within a couple of decades as you can see here around 2040 you'd have somewhere around 250 million dead profiles but as you can tell only a couple of decades later we have half a billion towards the end of the century we're going to have a billion or uh, 1.4 billion well th this is in a very unlikely scenario that Facebook stops growing as of 2019, and that is not true. They are still growing exponentially. Now, if they continue growing exponentially, which currently there are no signs that they will stop, until they saturate all markets uh, in the world, except China, um, we will get this graph instead, where, as you can tell, I mean, already within a couple of decades, we're hitting 1 billion. Um, towards the latter half of, of, of the century, it's rising fast until we have about 3 billion. And towards the end of the century, roughly 4.6 billion um, dead profiles, which is obviously a lot of dead profiles. So to the matter of when will the dead outnumber the living on Facebook? Well, in the first scenario, it actually looks like it's pretty soon. So somewhere in the late 2060s, it is at least plausible to assume that Facebook and of course many other social media services um, are gonna be 
populated by more dead than alive users. Now, if they continue growing and attract younger markets, um, such as uh, South Asia and, and Africa primarily, we're not quite going to see the same development. Um, we assume that within the beginning of, of the next century sometime, um, we're going to meet this, this crossover. Now, of course, these, these graphs make kind of flashy headlines, but there is a quite important political and ethical um, challenge hidden in, in these graphs or in these data. Well, there's something that um, I really realized when, when looking at uh, these data is that in the future, these are going to be the, our primary historical sources. So I'm quoting another researcher here, Varando, uh, saying that social media, uh, social networking accounts may be the principal and eventually only source for future generations to learn about their predecessors. And at first, when you look at this, it kind of sounds a bit impossible. Isn't social media, after all, just um, a representation of society and often a kind of polished picture of what goes on in society? Well, yes and no. To this, I have two responses. And the first one is that social media is not just a representation of society, but rather today society takes place within social media. I think the Arabic Spring and, and the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States are both good examples of uh, how society is not just something that is reflected on social media, but these movements are born on social media. They take place there. So when we in the future write the history about uh, political movements in, in the early 21st century, these are the data that we're going to be able to use. Uh, we're going to be forced to use um, big data, behavioral data, um, various patterns of social movements, but also on an individual level. I mean, imagine if we could have access to the Facebook profile or the, the Twitter profile of, um, I don't know, Napoleon or Jesus Christ or whatever historical figure. I mean, the data that we produce today are the historical material of yesterday, or, or, or sorry, of tomorrow. So I tend to think of this in, in terms of a global digital heritage that we're accumulating right now. We are accumulating, as indicated by these graphs, a truly global archive of human behavior. Actually, the, the biggest archive of human behavior ever assembled in the history of our species. So this is something that is important, not only to the individual users on the network, but rather something that is important to the self-understanding of our entire species. All right, the problem with this is that even though there is this great uh, historical value to uh, the Facebook archive, there is certainly no guarantee that it will last forever. To quote uh, um, Rothenberg, another scholar on this matter, digital information lasts forever or five years, whichever comes first. Because it's notoriously difficult to uh, curate an archive of this site or of this size unless there are clear financial um, commercial incentives to do so. So the question is if Facebook can't make any money off from these billions of dead profiles, what are they going to do about them? Are they going to destroy them? Are they going to uh, try to commercialize them in, in kind of like this digital afterlife industry bit that I, that I showed in the beginning? Are they going to have uh, individuals paying for their, their ancestors' profiles to stay up on the network? Either of these examples kind of distort and threatens to actually destroy the digital global heritage um, of the network, which would be very unfortunate to say the least. 
But there's an even graver uh, challenge here, which is the political aspect. Because what we're heading towards with uh, the concentration of data, uh, behavioral data in, in increasingly fewer hands, is that when these data become historical data, um, we're gonna approach a situation where we have a data monopoly or rather a monopoly on history. And here we quote uh, George Orwell from his 1984 uh, novel, where one of the party members says, we, the party, control all records and we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? Well, the, the direction we're heading towards right now is more or less we, Facebook, controls all records and we control all memories and then we control the past, do we not? And that is a quite frightening situation um, from, from a political point of view because if you control history or if you control the, the archives of history, uh, not only do you control who makes it into the records, who is important enough not to be deleted, but you can also shape the narratives um, around uh, these events. I mean, as, as I'm sure many of you know, working with, with data, data can be portrayed um, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and if you have the power to, to shape it, well, then you also have an immense power over society. Um, so our conclusion in this study, uh, we're, I mean, I think that my, my uh, role as a researcher is more to ask difficult questions than to provide solutions. Um, but nevertheless, I think I have some kind of responsibility of, of um, pointing in what direction I think that we can find solutions. Um, and I think the, the, the key word here is decentralization. Again, we can compare the, the data to, to human remains in a museum. So whenever you have, when you update um, an exhibition in a museum, you take in people from a plural, plurality of, of disciplines and, and, and backgrounds, and each of them give their perspective on what's worth keeping. You know, what is valuable here? And I, I think that the direction we should head towards is something similar that right now the question, what data is worth keeping, is purely understood as a commercial question of what data can generate profit. But that's kind of a narrow view if we're talking about the global digital heritage. Um, so our argument in, in this 2019 paper is rather that Facebook should invite other, um, other sectors, um, academics, scholars, philosophers, um, even public policy people um, to be part of this, this selection process of what data is worth keeping. Now, whenever I present this argument or, or this study in general, I, I always get the same response, which is, but what if Facebook goes bust? How do you know that Facebook is even gonna be around in two or three or four decades. Don't social media companies just come and go all the time? Well, there's certainly some truth to that. But wouldn't the insolvency of Facebook make this matter even more interesting? Because what happens in a bankruptcy or insolvency case? Well, what happens is that you have an, an insolvency lawyer coming in and they start selling off the assets of the company to the highest bidder. Well, the assets in this case is user data. So what would happen if Facebook went bust is basically that someone comes in and they start selling off the data to the highest bidder. And that could be Russia or China or any other company basically. Now, there are some restrictions. Uh, for instance, in, in the GDPR, 
it regulates that um, data subjects uh, can only be sold off, or their, their data can only be sold off to companies that work within the same sector, so to other social media companies. Now, none of these restrictions go for the dead. The dead are completely without any protection in a case of a Facebook insolvency. <clears throat> and why is this worrisome? Well, it's worrisome because buying data about people um, can be really effective in gaining insight on other people. So let me give an example. I may not have any data about you, but I can buy your dead parents and maybe your dead siblings' Facebook data. And from that data, I can actually do a lot of inferences about you, the data subject that I don't have any personal information about. Moreover, if Facebook is a digital heritage, an archive of, of, of truly global significance and, and has a digital heritage status, I mean, a Facebook insolvency case would truly destroy uh, that amazing archive that, that has been built. Um, so we make a couple of um, recommendations in this study, one of which is to include deceased data subjects to be protected in insolvency law. Uh, so right now they're not at all part of the GDPR, but at least on this instance, we claim that it would be reasonable to include also dead data subjects in this uh, protection. And secondly, we suggest that something like a digital word, world heritage label should be implemented. So the way the, world, the UNESCO um, World Heritage Label works is that, you know, they're saying, okay, we, we realize that this particular country has some kind of artifact or some kind of site that has significance not only for their national culture, but for us as a species. And what UNESCO says is, okay, we'll help you out uh, in managing and curating this site or this artifact, but we still respect your sovereignty. Well, a similar model could actually be, be implemented for, for a company like Facebook, where we say, look, it's the interest of humanity to preserve and curate this archive, but we realize that, you know, we can't get access to the actual data, we can't uh, make it public in any way, but we do have an interest in at least preserving it for future generations. Um, and this could be an interesting compromise uh, to, uh, to implement. And of course, at this stage, it's just an embryo of an idea, but I think it's a path worth uh, thinking about and exploring uh, and it's actually the paper that I'm uh, about to, to start writing just after my PhD, uh, which hopefully will be submitted this month, or sorry, next month, um, on how to actually craft such a, such a label. All right, um, I think, let's see. I think that was uh, about the 40 minutes that I have, so I would just like to, to wrap up um, by saying that, you know, I, I really don't have all the answers to how to manage um, digital remains or how to solve all the, the problems that we're facing. Um, but I really encourage all of you to start thinking about these issues because, um, I mean, as Brian pointed out, this is a matter that concerns all of us. And um, as I started by saying, you know, it, it concerns all of us as individuals because, you know, unfortunately, we are all going to die uh, sooner or later. Um, but also think about this in terms of um, if you're a part of a business um, or maybe you run your own business, you know, what's your stance on this? Um, have you thought about what happens to your users' data if, uh, if they should die and so on? But also, I think that it's important to, to make up your mind as a citizen. So not only thinking about your private individual digital remains, but also thinking about those remains as a contribution to 
the historical archives and materials of future generations. And how do you want that to be curated and managed? That is a question that we really need to think about individually and collectively for the next couple of decades. Thank you, that was my presentation.